Hello my friend and welcome to the tasting of the gear. Today we have the water bottles, the grappling hooks and a load up that will blow you away. Just kidding. Hey guys, welcome to Gear Tasting, where I'll be going over what we're up to and currently evaluating the ITS headquarters, as well as answer your questions over coffee. Uh, today, what I wanted to work through is showing you the loadout that I just used at Muster. So, we have our annual skill set development conference that we host each year. Uh, we bring in respected instructors from uh, their portions of the industry and have them collaborate to uh, instruct our attendees that come to Muster. So, basically, it's uh, putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak, and going over the skill sets that we advocate on ITS in person. Um, so check it out next year. Uh, it was in, obviously, October this year. We'll be having another one in 2016 in October, so be sure to jump in on that if you're interested. So I wanted to work through the loadout. This is kind of something that's continually evolving with me personally. Um, I kind of go back and forth between what I carry and uh, chest rig versus backpack versus on my person. So I'll be kind of going through my my loadout of kind of what I carried as well as walking you through my uh, thought process behind those. Okay, first before I start going over, I, I guess I'm gonna break this down into like first line, second line, third line. So before I go through that, what I wanted to just mention is I've talked about the LBT chest rigs and their, their configurations as of late on gear tasting. Um, I'm a, I've been a big fan of the mass gray color that LBT released a while back. Um, this was a, a color that they did for the Navy, but they released a bunch of stuff on the, I guess, their, their market online um, in mass gray. So, you know, I picked up a backpack, a chest rig, and some other stuff, and as I started to kind of fall in love with the color, I realized that it's pretty effective at night. Um, during muster, too, I kind of got to see that firsthand, both through night vision as well as just walking around in the woods um, as we were kind of scouting some student locations as they were kind of held, hidden up in a, uh, an OP or observation point overnight. So basically what I have here is the 1961 chest rig from LBT um, in this mass gray color, but you know, obviously there's the discrepancy between this and like a foliage color or something like that or an OD green. So um, I was actually able to pick up a set of uh, BDUs, they're called underway BDUs that uh, were also produced on that contract run. I got these on the secondary market, but um, you can see that it's, uh, it's a pretty close match to the, the mass gray color. So that's what I was wearing out there. Um, in the first line or on my person, not counting, this is kind of second line here on the chest rig, but um, I've always been a big fan of the pig gloves. I was wearing a pair of those. Um, had a Princeton Tech headlamp on around my neck. I have the Emerson A100 was in my pocket. I always take an EDC kit with me. So this has got a full size soft T wide tourniquet. This is our ITS EDC kit, um, as well as a pack of combat gauze and some gloves. Um, I have our urban kit. Um, this is basically broken down and, and stashed on me in different places, um, as well as on my wrist. I carry the Garmin uh, Fortrex 401. I very much love this GPS. I had talked on an earlier gear tasting about running this EOG wrist strap, and I'm a very big fan of it. Um, I found it pretty versatile. Not only can, you know, can I wear it on the wrist, um, but I can strap it around uh, my chest rig right here if I need to get it off my wrist and um, for a purpose like that too. So it's pretty convenient. It's easy to, to basically take on and put on and take off. So the other thing I use to I carry this in, in a pocket is uh, kind of some nunchucks. I just kind of came up with this on the fly one day. So I took an IR chem light and a green chem light and put them on either end of a, a piece of dummy cord. Um, that way I can basically just spin them around for a, uh, for a buzz saw for signaling. And then additionally, I've got this little Phoenix IR. Uh, this is the 123 version from, I'm um, gonna forget the company, CJ Engineering. So I carry it like this, so all I have to do is pull the 123 battery out and flip it around to activate it. And they do say that it's okay to carry it in that configuration. So that's just a little IR strobe signaling device. So then if I'm wearing a helmet, so I was there because uh, I was running nods. So um, if I'm wearing a helmet, this is what I have. Again, this was a Coyote um, Ops Core 
base jump helmet that I, I actually found a pretty good matching spray paint color that I painted this to kind of match the mass gray color too. And then uh, if I am running comms, um, I wasn't out there. I was just running a radio, which I'll talk about in a second, but um, I'll use Sordens if I was doing that. And then on my waist, I had the, the PDW Griffin knife. And then let's talk about second line. So I'll move this stuff out of the way. That's kind of the, the basics of what I would carry on me. Also have a cell phone, just depending on where I was, hopefully in a life-proof case or something like that. So again, this is the uh, 1961 chest rig from LBT. I'm just kind of working through what I have on the chest rig first before I open the pockets. So um, hanging off of this are my pace count beads. Um, we did a pretty thorough article on ITS a while back on how to make your own pace count beads. You can check that out. Um, also hanging off the straps, I usually have a, um, a little light like this. This is the light from Photon, little Photon light in red. And then the hydration pack on the 1961 is attached to the back, and that's a source bladder that I have. And uh, I definitely prefer this style bite valve. I forget what that's called. <laughs> there you go. Then uh, I like the way that the hydration bladder attaches to the 1961 chest rig. So the actual waist strap is ditched, so the waist strap cuts away and it interacts with the, the back of this. So now this becomes your waist strap here and that's how it clips in to the bottom. And through the top, it actually routes through here. So these clip on to the, the top of the 1961 as well as this piece wraps around the, uh, not really sure what to call that, but the, the intersecting piece between the, uh, the shoulder straps and the hydration bladder. So getting into the pockets of this thing, kind of fillet this out a little more. All right, so um, basically the way I have this set up is commonly in a 1961 rig, these are usually used for either batteries for comms or um, M60 gunners we use these large pockets for for their ammo but I've kind of repurposed these pockets for a couple of different things and again this loadout that I'm going to show you I typically will run uh, M4 mags in these pockets here on the chest rig which you know we weren't doing any shooting there so I also have some shooting accessories that I'll show which are inside the chest rig but just so you know this is more geared towards you know a non-shooting setup at this time so on the inside of these, uh, these larger pockets, um, there's a large Velcro piece which uh, interfaces. This is an EOG uh, chem light holder. So this holds little mini chem lights. I found it pretty easy to kind of use as, as a uh, additional spot to store chem lights. So that's what I use there. Um, these interior pockets here on the insides of these larger pockets. Um, I've got batteries, so AA and 123s in that pocket. I've got some bore snakes. These are, this is a 5.56 and a 9 millimeter bore snake. Uh, working back again, I've got a full size trauma kit, one of our ETA trauma kit advanced. Uh, this takes care of those pockets. Um, in this pocket, I've got a small survival blanket that I put into a, a lock sack bag, as well as kind of our full sized survival kit that I've kind of built with some different, kind of customized that a little bit from our, our standard uh, mini survival kit. And these are the, uh, the MPCs that we sell, the uh, hard cased survival kit tins, which are great because you can actually take the contents out and dig with it as well. So working forward in there, in from there, I've got a full size soft T wide tourniquet. On this side, attached to the shoulder strap here, I've got a compass. This is a Sunto Global Compass. This is the MC2. And then, actually also in the smaller pocket, I've got backup hearing protection. This is the old GI style Ear Pro. 
Then I've got a multitasker. This is the Gen 3 or Series 3 from multitasker. And sometimes, depending on the loadout, like I was saying, some of this is geared towards shooting. Um, but sometimes I'll just put in kind of the regular SOG uh, multi-tool for that as a replacement. All right, so in this pocket, I've got a small bottle of Slip 2000 EWL, as well as a small flashlight I got. This is a 511 flashlight I picked up from a shooting course I was at, just kind of a freebie. But I was using it because I like the size and I like the brightness on it. It's just kind of a, a smaller flashlight, which I like. It fits into this pocket well. But what happened is I was out on nods. Um, I was resting my hands on top of the chest rig and had a, uh, an ND with a flashlight. And you can see on the bottom here, it's got a, a grommet or a drainage hole on the bottom. And it actually ND'd onto the ground and lit up where we were at. So needless to say, I'm going to be switching out this flashlight. That was kind of my, uh, my feedback or my lesson learned from there. So even if you take this tail cap and turn it almost all the way out to where it's almost falling off, that flashlight still turns on, so you still have that same incident happening. Um, really what I need to do is get a good flashlight that's got a lockout tail cap. Um, I've got a Surefire Aviator A2 that I, I like, but it's a little tall, so I'm just going to kind of keep looking for a smaller flashlight that fits this profile pretty well, but uh, does, that does have a lockout tail cap. So moving on to the center of the chest rig, this actually, I like the admin area for this, so this whole entire pocket here opens up into the chest rig, which I like. Um, I've got a map. It's kind of a map sealed in the lock sack bag from the, the location we were at. Uh, I've got my protractor. This is a map tools uh, UTM plotter. Small Bic lighter. A MPIL signal panel. And accoutrement of different uh, pens and pencils and stuff here. So I've got a, a small Sharpie Fisher space pen as well as a right in the rain pencil. This is one of the newer pencils that they have. We're kind of running these as a test um, at Muster. And I like the fact that the lead um, is a better lead. It doesn't break as easily as other pencils, but the eraser, um, which removes to you know drop the lead out is very, it's very finicky, so it doesn't take much for that eraser to drop out and all your lead to, to uh, basically get lost. So just a little a tip on the pencil. And that's what I carry in the admin area. So that kind of works through the second line here. And again, with the comms, um, like I was talking about, this, this uh, NATO drop lead, and I've mentioned this on another gear tasting, so I won't get too far into it, but um, that NATO drop lead can connect to a push-to-talk and then get routed to a radio. And the way I was running the radio without the, the comm setup like that is that I just had it on a shoulder strap like this. So it would be run like so. I would drop it through like that. And then I have a, a dummy cord. This is a, a PDW lanyard. And I'd clip it right around the shoulder strap like this. So it's lanyarded in, in case I drop it. And then the large and large whip antenna would just get tucked into this rigger's rubber band. I have it on my shoulder to keep it out of the way and out of my face. So that is that. Again, if I was using this, um, I could also run the a remote antenna as well. So I've done that with this rig before. Just basically route it up through the molly on the on the hydration reservoir. All right, so moving on to third line. So I have a LBT three-day pack in that masquerade color too. And I just wanted to walk through a couple of things I typically keep in the larger pack. Um, I like to leave room in case I want to stash my helmet in the pack too, so I try not to overload it too much. Um, typically I'll have some kind of MRE or, or food in the pack. Um, a larger signal panel. Um, I've got a favorite pair of binoculars I have. These are the M24 binoculars um, with little kill flash attachments on them. Um, I always typically have those in a backpack for sure. And then I also carry some kind of a, a couple of waterproof bags for extras as well as a waterproof stuff sack. This is just an old uh, GI field pack liner. 
So what I'll put in this is any kind of clothing, warmies that I have. I'll sometimes keep those in, in the pack depending on what the temperatures are like. Um, this is an Atom jacket from Arcterix. And one thing I think is cool is that they showed on a blog post a while back that you can just take the jacket and stuff everything inside one of the sleeves, which I think is a kind of a cool way to make this a little more compact when you're storing it. And you take this sleeve, just push it together and get a little more compact nature of the jacket. So again, warmies, um, I'll typically carry some spare chem lights if I need them, the larger style versus the mini ones. Um, always have extra rigor rubber bands and at least some extra dummy cord, depending on what I'm doing. Um, paracord, if you're interested in this method of storing paracord, we did a knot of the week a couple years ago on how to wrap one of these. I'll make sure I link to that. And then um, this is just some one wrap in case I have to tie up loose straps, um, some battle systems tape, as well as some, uh, a small roll of Gorilla tape. So those are the main items that I'll carry in like a third line. So. I know that was kind of a breeze through, took a little while, but I want to just kind of show what I typically carry too. And this kind of ebbs and flows. It's always a work in progress, so I'm always trying to figure out what I did use and didn't use. And obviously, I had stuff in this kit that really wasn't used. Like, I didn't use any of the shooting accessories because I wasn't shooting. So, you know, having the, uh, the boar snakes and uh, ear pro and things like that in there were kind of uh, pointless but I do like to always carry a survival kit and things like that too. So hope you enjoyed that little walkthrough. Um, feel free to ask any questions. All right, we have a couple of questions over coffee today. First is from Florida Prepper from YouTube who said, love the series, perhaps go over favorite water bottles, Nalgene, Clean Canteen, etc. on a future episode. Well, I'd be glad to. Um, just a word of warning, I've been drinking water for a long time and I'm quite the connoisseur on vessels to hold said water. So anyway, we've been carrying various products on ITS pretty much since the inception of the ITS store. We started out with uh, Liberty bottles, we were carrying those for a while. Those are a metal water bottle, as you can see here. Um, we've also developed a product to hold water bottles, and I'll talk about that in a little bit too, or a skeletonized bottle holder. But So Liberty bottle, one of the first bottles we started out with, um, we had had some problems in the beginning with uh, the bottoms kind of bowing out as people dropped them. Um, that's not one of the reasons we're not carrying them anymore. We've just kind of... Uh, come into Nalgene's and vapor bottles and things like that. So I'm going to talk about those as well. So Liberty, great water bottle. Um, this was uh, one of the first American made water bottles on the market. Um, if not the only still, I, I'd have to do my research again. But as far as I know, um, they're one of the only American made water bottles on the market, metal water bottles. Uh, they do have a lining inside, which um, often cracked and chipped um, as you used it too. So it was one of those situations where it wouldn't always happen, but we did have some, some people talking about that and addressing that issue with us, and Liberty was great to replace them, so no knock on them for that, um, just something to be aware of. So I mentioned that just to say that you wouldn't want to boil water in, one, in a Liberty bottle. Um, you would want to use a dedicated stainless steel uh, water bottle. And I think the stainless steel Nalgene's uh, that they make, this is not a stainless steel one, this is a glow and dark one, but I believe that they're not made in America. I could be wrong, I'll have to research that as well. But um, anyway, a stainless steel Nalgene or a clean canteen or something to that effect that stainless steel is great if you want to boil water in it. Um, I'm of the opinion though that I would want to use a dedicated source for water purification like tablets or a filter or something like that rather than defer to um, having to build a fire, take my water bottle, place it in the fire, boil water, the wait for it to cool, and then drink it. So it's really kind of a, uh, it's really kind of your, your choice on that when it comes to uh, using it for water purification. So um, as everybody knows, the best way to 
kill pathogens is to boil water, but you're not always in the situation where that's, um, that's the best scenario. So that being said, what we currently carry and what I personally prefer is uh, I keep going back to Nalgene. Uh, that's just, you know, it's American made. The only downside to these, in my opinion, is that they're, they are so damn tough. You can drop these things. I've personally watched somebody drop two of these out of a backpack hanging upside down off a mountain when we were rappelling. They bounced and nothing was wrong. No cracks, no problems whatsoever. So they're very sturdy. They're made out of Lexan, uh, made in the U.S. They're, they're super dependable. The problem with them is they're super rigid as well. So um, we also carry uh, vapor bottles, which I'm a huge fan of. I didn't think I'd like them at first. I thought they were, you know, not going to stand up to the abuse that we put them under. Uh, I've personally filled one of these with water. We had a video a while back when we first started carrying them. I stood on it with all my weight and it didn't bust. Um, I've, I've put these through the ringer and, and they're great. Uh, what I like about them is not only they have a nice seal on the lid, but you can fold them up and tuck this carabiner around them and put it in a pocket. So it folds up really nice, very easy to store. Uh, takes up almost no space whatsoever. Uh, my only complaint, just to, and just to talk about everything in terms of water bottles, uh, my only can be complaint would be the, the attachment method here, this plastic carabiner. The, uh, the wire gate sometimes flops out like that. Um, and you can remove it, you know, if you don't want to use that whatsoever, you could just have it like that too. So um, that would be my only thing is just that that clip that they have that you're depending on to, to hang it from or whatever is um, can get a little sideways on you once in a while. But uh, we have these in both, uh, I think it's called olive and then midnight is the other color. So great options as well as a flask because if anyone is, that is uh, snuck provisions into a movie theater knows that once you're done with your flask, you still got to deal with it. So um, this is a great option. I think we've had something in this. <laughs> Uh, this is a great option to just, you know, store in a back pocket once you're through with it, too. So they also make a flask version of that. So now jeans, like I said, um, vapor bottles, Liberty bottles. Um, I'm also I've also used clean canteens, but personally, I just don't. I still have one tucked away in a cabinet somewhere. I like I said, I've been collecting water bottles for a long time. I've just kind of gone through them because I love water so much. So there you go. Hope that answers your question. If there's any specifics uh, that we didn't cover that you'd like to hear about, just let me know. So what's next? Grappling hooks, All right? Oh, hi. Hey, uh, so a relevant nonsense from Twitter says, what are those things that look like grappling hooks on the uh, shelf behind me? Uh, please be grappling hooks demo next week. Sure, be glad to. All right, so I have a couple of grappling hooks back here. There's three of them back here. Two of them are the same. And then, just to compare properly, this is, uh, this is a grappling hook that I've had since I was probably 11, 12 years old. And it's, a, it's an old school ninja grappling hook. As you can see, it's bent and twisted. Um, used to use this when I'd throw it up in the tree to hang a rope ladder or something like that when I was younger. But the premise of this is you twist it, you can store it like this and compress it. And this is a cheap piece of crap compared to real grappling hooks. So um, the purpose of these obviously is, uh, for me at least, it's to, to be able to reach heights, to throw a piece of line up and be able to climb on it. That's, that's the purpose for grappling hooks in my opinion. Um, I had, I'd been working on just kind of a, a rough prototype of something for quite a few years now, which is taking a, a painter's pole, attaching a grappling hook to it, and being able to hook in a, uh, a caving ladder. So through that, I've kind of acquired a couple of grappling hooks over the years to, to test with that. Um, been fairly successful with it. One of these days, I'll do a video on how to create your own with a painter's pole. It's, it's fairly simple, but... Um, my method takes a piece of PVC pipe and that's actually what's where the, the grappling hook fits into when you're, when you're hooking something. So at any rate, this is a kind of a cool grappling hook. I don't, 
I do not know the name of the this type of grappling hook, but what I like about it is that it has these pull pins and you can compress each of the claws, I guess, so to speak, on the grappling hook. So it folds down nicely. Um, you can pack, you can throw it in a pack um, versus these, which are made out of titanium, but they don't compress at all. So obviously that's a bigger footprint than this in a pack. So what I like about these though, is that they're great for uh, slipping into kind of that, that housing that I was talking about out of PVC. So you would basically slip that into the housing, you'd uh, carabiner on or lanyard in preferably carabiner in your uh, your caving ladder and then hook that pull off and then the pole drops away from the, the grappling hook and you're left with the caving ladder. So what would happen is you'd, you'd have a lead climber go up, they would attach kind of a safety pro to the top of the line wherever you're climbing to and then you know your other guys would get up the rope ladder or the uh, caving ladder. So anyway, just a quick run through on the grappling hooks that we have. Again, these are super lightweight because they're made out of titanium. And then this is aluminum. It's a bit heavier, but I do like the, uh, the compressibility of it. Guys, thanks for watching Gear Tasting. If you have any questions, be sure to use the pound tag Gear Tasting on all the social media outlets to get your question answered. Thanks again.